you know, this is a great segue into your real estate. You know, it's crazy because you are wildly successful in real estate investments. But that's not even your day job. Your day job, we just spent some time on. Yeah. So, so, so it's re, you know, it goes to, to, to number one, and we're going to get into how well you've done in real estate. But it goes to my point. If you want to be successful, here is your first rule. There are more than eight hours in a day. You are listening and watching a woman who has a full-time job, a full-time career, as an investor in the market. But you have found time to build a real estate portfolio of how many buildings do you own now? So I just sold one actually today. Um, It's actually the second property I ever bought. So I I sold, I bought it in 2004 and 16 years later, just just sold it and cleared, you know, cleared a nice little profit on it. Um, So I'm now down to 30 buildings some of which are single family um, and some of which are multifamily. So I think I'm up to just short of about 50 units total, 50, 50 doors, because some are single. A lot of them are single and some of them are, are multifamilies. Okay. Before we go deep into it, it seems like you, you have the same philosophy across um, the, the investing in the market as you have in real estate. You said that you just sold a property today that was the second property you ever bought back in 04. Yep. Is, is it that same mentality that you were talking about earlier in, in, in the stock market where you buy it and no matter how the market goes, whether it goes up, it goes down, no matter the fluctuation, you're in it for the long haul. You're not necessarily Definitely. flipping properties, correct? No, no, I don't, I don't, I, I was actually, um, I was actually reluctant to sell this. So when I bought this in 2004, I bought it with another stockbroker. He and I worked together. Um, and he's wanted to sell it for years. He's wanted to, wanted to sell it for a number of years. And we had long-term tenants there. And I said, I was able to use that as leverage. Like, look, we're putting very, we don't have to put very little, um, we put very little capital into this. The tenants are paying down the mortgage, um, effectively putting money in our pockets every single, every single month. So um, let's reconvene when the tenants, the long-term tenants leave. And, and, and they did, they finally moved out. So I was like, all right, fine, we can, we can sell it. Um, and I would have bought it out from, from him, but I, I like being in, in the hood. Like that's, that's where I like most of my real estate, which, you know, it's, it's interesting because you, you watch a lot of these podcasts, which I won't, I won't, I won't name them, but I, I you know, because I'd be bad. Feel, 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 feel free. I'm, yeah, like, I'm perfectly like, fine with it. Okay. Well, cool. Then. Cool. Um, bigger pockets, for example, um, which tends to have a lot of investors who do not look like us. I mean, I've heard investors on the bigger pockets podcast say like, don't invest in the ghetto, you know, like, you know, you, like, you know, you'll have like trashy tenants and trash your house. Like basically, you know, part of my friend shitting on marginalized communities, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's my preferred place to invest. I, I, I love investing in areas where um, people who are black and brown deserve to not have abandoned homes uh, on, their, on their blocks, you know, that, that have been abandoned and dilapidated for, for 20 or 30 years, right? Um, so this particular property that we were selling was in the suburbs. So I, I don't really want to be in the suburbs. I only have two outliers outside of, uh, two rentals out, uh, outside of um, the city of Philadelphia. So this was one of them. Uh, so I was actually okay about selling it. And I'll, I'll put that capital somewhere else. Um, and I still have one more property that's outside of city limits. But, um, you know, if it were in Philly, if it were in the hood, I actually would have would have bought him out. Um, but I, I do, I, 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 I tend to hold things a really, really long time. And again, Sean, this goes back to what we talked about earlier, our, our experiences and, and everything happens by divine purpose. Um, a part of the reason that I was so interested in real estate really early on is because I've got the story that so many people who look like you and I, so many black and brown people, um, have, have had auntie sell their house or grandma sell their house. And then suddenly the neighborhood gets gentrified, right? Yeah. That, happened, that happened to me. So when we lived in South Philly, we left Passion Projects. We lived in a part of South Philly that was relatively close to downtown Philly. And my, my first year in college, we were moving to a bigger house. My mom had my brother. She got married. My grandmother came and lived with us. So we needed, we needed more space. In South Philly, the houses are pretty small. And I remember telling my mom, I said, Mom, don't sell this house. I got a good feeling about this neighborhood. We're in walking distance to downtown Philly. It's rough now. So we lived in a house, but there was a, there was a housing project directly around the corner. We called the neighborhood Saigon. I mean, it was rough as shit, right? <laughs> so, 
So, I, but I told her, I said, look, I said, it's rough now, but I got a, I got a good feeling about it. So um, she got nervous. We were buying a house in Germantown and she got nervous and decided to sell the house. And she sold it for, I want to say like thirty-five dollars or $40,000. It was, it was like a pretty, a pretty low amount. And within, within 10 years, that house was easily in as is condition or the condition we left it in was probably easily worth half a million bucks just based on the location. Neighborhood had completely, completely changed. I mean, dog within parks. Within 10 years? Within 10 years. Wow. Dog parks, cafes, I mean, like all the good stuff, you know, like, like, you know, they was over to live and they had torn down the housing project, made it green space. Um, and I, re I remember when I saw the neighborhood changing, I remember thinking this will never happen to my family again. This will never, this, we, my family and, and whatever legacy that, that is in my blood, it, it, we will never be in a position where we sold an asset that I knew we should have, we should have held on to and, and passed down generation after generation. Um, so that, that for me, when I, when I became a licensed broker, real estate was always in the back of my mind. Like, okay, I'm, I'm an investor, period. You know, stocks are my first love, but you know, I, I'm, I'm gonna own some property. I'm gonna own some land. I remember, I remember reading a book, um, because I'm an, I'm, I'm an avid reader. And I think it was one of, I think it was one of Toni Morrison's books. And she talked about like, people always need a place to live and a place to die. Right. So, so for me, and, and Oprah says one of my, one of my great, one of, one of my favorite quotes by her, she said something like, um, I love land the way most women love shoes. Right. So when you think about like, when, when I think about land, when I think about people always needing a place to live, I mean, I, for me, real estate always just made sense. So even though I was investing in stocks, I was thinking eventually I was going to get into real estate and I was going to have revenge um, for future generations and future legacies on that house we sold. So, um, so because of that, I almost never sell my real estate. Like I, 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 had a, I had a small, like I felt a little bit some kind of way when I was in closing, like, you know, we sell in this house and I don't, I don't really dig it. But the fact that it's in the suburbs, the fact that I'm going to net a good profit, the fact that I've held it, you know, over a decade um, and, and made good money on it. But I'm gonna, I'm, I will think about that house forever. Like, I, I'll, I'll think about the house I grew up in, you know, the, the one in South Philly that my mom sold. I will never forget that house. And I will never forget that lesson. Um, so that, that's to me why real estate has always been something that's been, been, been interesting. It was a passion of mine. So going back into communities that look like the one that I grew up in. So in 2011, when I decided to really get busy in real estate, I went slightly south of where we sold that house. So we sold that house um, in South Philly. And, and at the time in 2011, kind of the rule was don't go south of Washington Avenue, right? It was like, so north of Washington was like nice and, you know, safer and cleaner. And they were like, yeah, don't go south of Washington because it's rough and you'll get, and I'm like, I'm, I'm from rough. You know what I mean? Like, what, what, what are we talking? So, and I, and I also remember thinking, there's no physical barrier that will prevent people from coming south of Washington. You people are idiots. Like, you know, if, if north of Washington becomes far too expensive, eventually, what the heck do you think is going to happen? People will start to move south of Washington. Like, that, that didn't take, and, and people are like, you know, well, how did you know? It didn't take rocket science. Eventually, like, people are going to run out of opportunities north of Washington. So I bought south of Washington, and eventually, of course, the wave. Uh, gradually came south of Washington. So houses in 2011 that I was buying for 50,000, um, one of my houses, most, most houses in Philly share a party wall. They're row houses or townhouses, whatever you want to call them. Um, I remember the first one I bought, I paid 56,000 for. I share a party wall with a house that just sold for a year ago, sold for 450,000, I believe. Incredible. So not, yeah, not only have I collected rent on the thing for eight, nine years, but I mean, the thing has gone up in value, just a, a ridiculous amount of money. So, so real estate um, is probably, is probably my favorite asset class now. I mean, I love stocks, but I love how predictable real estate is. I like the fact that you can insure against, you know, real estate. And, and, and typically all the folks that tell you, you know, you see a lot of real estate bashing on social media, like, oh, I had a bad experience as a landlord. Oh, that was probably some mistakes that you made. So there are things that we can do to protect ourselves as, as landlords and as real estate investors, um, which is one of the reasons why my burgeoning hobby, which was buying houses, ended up being, you know, a multi-million dollar business at this point. Uh, this, the world is in a very peculiar place. I don't know how else to say it. Um, right now, the market is way up. Mm -hmm. But you would also think that with COVID, 
the real estate market would be down, but that's way up. Yeah. So what do you attribute this? It, it, I mean, it goes against everything that we think we know because this is not, it's not a mirror image of 08, 09, 10, 11. Yep. Although some, you know, we're in a recession. So yep. why is everything up at this moment in your opinion? Yeah, you're talking my language, Sean. So, so a couple things. A, a part of uh, one of the reasons why um, I, I was willing to sell the house today. Two reasons: one, location; the other, liquidity. And a part of the reason I wanted access to more liquidity, more capital, is because I believe that there are reasons why the real estate market should be lower than it is today. You know, I mean, you, you, like even though over the last couple of months, um, forbearance uh, for folks that are that are like not paying their mortgage has, has gone down over the last couple of months. It's not as high as it was um, when, when COVID first hit or around the spring or early summer. Um, however, there are still a lot of homeowners in mortgage forbearance, right? So that could possibly trigger a lot of foreclosures, which we know what that does to the real estate market. There, there are two reasons why I believe that the real estate market today is basically where it was pre-COVID. Um, one, you've got very little inventory that's, uh, that's on the market for sale in a lot of markets, right? So I, I was reading an article a couple of months ago that said that the inventory that was for sale in Philly was roughly half of what it was this time last year. So when you've got significantly fewer homes in the market, I mean, think about it, Sean, if you didn't have to sell your house, right? If you didn't have to go, would you put your house in the market, have folks, strangers coming in and out of your house all day, Absolutely. they touching your stuff, coughing, you know, it's some kids running around your house, like, you know, during the, during the showings. So folks that don't have to sell um, because they're, you know, they're required to or they can't afford it. So folks that don't have to sell are not. They're not listing their houses. So because there are fewer properties on the market, low inventory, that dry, that, like, like that, that keeps prices relatively stable. I mean, there are bidding wars going on right now. Like you get one property that comes on the market that meets all of your criteria. I, uh, my realtor told me t today that um, a house that, that recently listed um, where, the, where the one that I just sold was, there were 70 offers on that, on that property. 70 because there's so few properties that are on the market. So when you, when you get a halfway decent one, folks are like, well, I need that one. So you got so many people who are bidding. The other thing is, um, or the other reason why property values haven't declined drastically is because interest rates are at historically low levels. I mean, it's insane. I remember the very first property and I had, I had great credit. The very first property that I bought, my interest rate was like 7.5%, 7.6%. You know, we're talking early 2000s, 20 years ago. I've seen people today refinancing or doing 30 year fixed mortgages sub three under 3%. So when interest rates are that low, when inventory is that low, I believe that's why home values have not only just stayed, not only stayed the same, but in a lot of cases, in a lot of markets, they've actually gone, gone up. What's up guys. Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.